Botox. We had a very busy past week so we heard on the call talking about prosthetic feet, specifically processor Elon. And tonight I have another very special guest with me. Many of you might recognize him as John Hatting from Hatting Incorporated Prosthetics. Hi there. All right, guys, for those of you who are new to the show, the hazing ritual is basically you got to let me know who you are, where you're from, and what's in your coffee mug this evening. So here's to all of you. John, do you have anything interesting here? She, oh, finally. I know. The guest of Cozy Talks did not have official coffee mug, so I was a little just so thank you. You brought the coffee mug. We got Ashley here from uh, Tennessee. We got Vicky on board. Guys, don't be shy. I love knowing where people are from. And if this is your first time, welcome. Hey, Julie, welcome back. Guys, those of you who know John, give him a shout out. A very familiar face to, I think, many of you. We've got Ron here. He says, in Arkansas, snow and hot, hot chocolate. Well, John, since you work in Leesburg, Virginia, can we expect Hi, a conference? <laughs> John, can you see the comments? I can. I'm just pulling them up now. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'll try to. I'll try to feed them to you because I know they go by pretty quick. We got Jill. Yeah, they do. They fly. Yes, um, they do. <laughs> Robert, thank you for coming. Hey, Barbara. We got the. You got the coffee on board. We got Stephen. Expecting four inches of snow. Woo! I won't tell you. <laughs> it's hot here in Florida. It's wrong. I do work in Leesburg. Thank you. There we go. So you're in a little cold weather right now, John? Huh? We. The cold is coming in. Yes. It is. All right, we got David on board. Good, we got a nice little group here this evening, guys. We got Vicky, Mark, Grant, Harsh, Karen. All right, they're really starting to come in. Hi, guys. All right, we got Robin. Robin, thank you for joining us this evening. Both hands on the wheel, Robin, thank you. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and get started. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. My name is Kosi Bayoso. I'm a physical therapist, amputee specialist here in Tampa, Florida. And with me this evening, I have John Hatting, prosthetist and owner of Hatting Incorporated Prosthetics in Leesburg, Virginia. So I am so excited. So this, this year in 2020, I've been doing things a little bit differently, bringing in special guests. And he is my first spotlight interview for 2020. And with thank you, thank you for the invite. I appreciate no, it. No, no, no. I'm, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, folks, with these spotlight interviews, I want to take people who are really making waves in the amputee limb loss community and not necessarily that they're in all the newspapers or magazines, but they are giving quality care to their patients. And if you open up anything in Facebook related to amputee related website, at some point you're going to run into John's name and it's for a very good reason. So we got, let's see what we got. We got Vicki here from Florida and Winter Haven. Uh, March, yes, we got quite cold here. Yeah. <laughs> are you cold in Florida? Oh yeah. We got down to the thirties. Loser. That's respectable for us. That's respectable cold. So guys, I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of a backstory here. So some of you who have recently joined me, I actually started this show two years ago on an amputee support group. And as I was starting to open up my clinic, I wanted to get to know my patient population better. I wanted to know what were my patients talking about outside of my clinic? What were the obstacles and problems they were running into? So I started listening to the support groups and seeing all the questions and I decided, okay, let me try going live one night and just seeing if I can answer people's questions. So I asked support group after support group after support group and nobody wanted to give me a chance, which is understandable because, you know, the support group administrators have to keep a pretty tight ship with these support groups. So the support group that decided to take a risk with me was help and support me. Sorry. They were the first ones to allow me to start the life. They need the coffee cup. <coughs> anyway, so to carry on with his story, Michelle runs MBT Help and Support, and Michelle decided that it would be a really good fit. Okosi to come on and help us with the physical therapy aspect of of MPT help and support. So and she became a regular. And then when once it took off on our page, then everybody wanted her. So there you have it. So again, this is my this is the only way I can thank John and Michelle for this opportunity because I certainly didn't know two years ago that this was going to become, you know, what it's become and be able to reach um, as many people as as 
we've been able to reach. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So enough about me. We need to hear about you, John. So for those of you who don't know you, tell us you're not you're not quite from around these parts. That's very true. Um, born South African, um, we immigrated to the U.S. in 1990. Um, I was one of the design engineers for the silicon roll-on liner, and that was my ticket into the country. Oh, wow. um, because in those days, um, you had to have skills that an American uh, colleague didn't have. So, and and nobody knew anything about silicon roll-on liners in those days. So that was my ticket into the country. Um, I flew around. I taught at every major institution. Um, Cascade Orthopedic Supply was the distributor. Okay. They flew me to every institution and I taught silicone roll-on systems. So that was my ticket into the country. Wow. And our port of entry at the time was um, Seattle. Okay. And we stayed in Seattle for 25 years. Um, then we went back to Africa. Um, who I did philanthropic work. Uh, I had a non-compete with whoever bought my clinic. And then after my non-compete expired, we looked for a for a weather pattern that was similar to Cape Town so that Michelle could exist in that weather pattern. And Virginia was the closest. So that was the reason to move back to Virginia. No other reason. Got it. Got it. And then we, we hung out for a bit just to make sure that everything was going to work. And then we opened up this clinic in 2013. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, so it's young. What made you decide to open up a clinic versus letting someone else handle all the headaches of being a business owner and just see patients? You know, nobody wanted to employ me because they thought I was too old, I think. They came up with a whole lot of excuses. But the underlying issue was really, do you think you could keep up, you know, because, I mean, yeah, so nobody wanted me. <clears throat> That, that's, so, really that's why I went back into private clinic. <laughs> so the years and years and years and years and years of experience. Right. No, they thought I was too old, I that's think. It. Yeah. It's interesting, John. I think every person that I've asked who's opened up their own business, their own clinic later on in their career has some sort of story that makes you go, what? Like, you know, for me, it was they wanted to hire me. They just didn't think they needed me for amputees. There wasn't a need. Right. For right. Hmm. right. So, I know. Crazy. Just toss it out the window and say, fine, I'll do it myself. I, I mean, 40 years experience, 35,000 patients in a 40 year career span. Um, and yeah, they thought, I think they thought I was too old, but that was a good thing. I mean, the clinic, you know, it was nice to open up a small clinic that we, we could really focus on patient care. I only see four patients a day. I spend two hours per patient, per uh, clinic appointment, so I, I can really focus on issues and solve them. And that's really the clinic, the base of the clinic is is doing challenging cases. It's nice to see an easy case now and again, but the majority of them are challenging. Those are the most rewarding. Those right. are the most rewarding. I love those cases myself. So we've got Daniel on board, Mark, Vicky, and Ron. Carol says, hi, Cozy, having a cup of decaf in my Cozy mug. It's a rainy, cold night in Richmond, Virginia. You've got a couple of Richmond folks listening in tonight. It's cold here too. We had to warm up the barn. The horses, the horses are going to be cold if we didn't warm up the barn. How many horses? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like skewing off a little bit. How many horses do you have? Um, Michelle has eleven now. Yeah. I've got four kids, but eleven horses scares me more than four kids. <laughs> I know. Wow. Wow. Linda, hey, love to have you on board, Linda. So, John, before we started the, the show, I was picking your brain about your experience, which was 40 plus years. Right. There is a lot to choose from. So, folks, we're just going to touch a little bit, but this man's wealth of knowledge is all over the place. So you opened up in 2013 and you decided to create your own patient business model. Um, you know, it was very foreign to um, depend on social media as opposed to depend on local doctor referral. And we found that the majority of patients that really struggled were the ones that went onto social media to ask questions. So not only do I answer questions on, on Michelle's health page and on quite a few of the other pages, um, but if patients can't find solutions, then we suggest that they come to the clinic 
So we have a destination program that Michelle started. Um, we help with with patients travel. We have an apartment where they stay for free. Uh, they normally arrive on a Sunday. We treat them Monday to Friday, start to finish, and then they go back home on a Saturday. And we have a hundred percent success rate so far, so that's good. And then, so do you decide to to open the amputee help and support line? So, because there were so many questions that came to Michelle personally, because she's also been in the business for you know thirty odd years for, and and she's an administrator for our clinic, so she deals with all of the problems and questions that patients ask. And then she said, you know, there's so many patients that need help and, and have questions. Why don't I start this page? And then we can, we can help them and answer questions. And I mean, th th they, they close to 10,000 members. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Wow. I, mean, I remember in 2018 when I joined, it was 5,000. So you've it's, almost it's, doubled your numbers. It's almost the doubled. Yeah. And it just keeps on going. I mean, it doesn't stop. Wow. And I have to, I mean, I have to admit one of the reasons why I love there's, there's, I have three top favorites and I will name amputee help and support line as one of my favorite support groups on Facebook is that it's, it's a very tight run ship. Um, despite the fact that it's such a large group between right. the administrators that you have, right. you're on a tight ship and that's, that's, that provides comfort, I think, to the folks right. who belong there. Right. Um, and as a clinician myself, I know that whenever I've posted anything on there, um, I feel safe posting on there. <laughs> right. And if there are any questions, I mean, if if Michelle can't answer it or Jesse can't answer it, then they'll actually link me in the question and then I, I normally answer it and, and give patients suggestions on how to remedy it. Yeah. So guys, if, if this is something that you're interested in, there is a small application process to join the amputee help and support line on Facebook Facebook group. Um, you do have to fill out a small application, obviously, to make sure that you are there for the right reasons. Right. But it's truly a wonderful group. So I would encourage you, if you're looking for a group, this is one definitely to check out. Humbling. Thank you. No, of course. So, John, um, what actually made you decide to become a practice in the first place? Like where did that? No, I, w I was an engineer, um, and and I I happened to meet a patient or an amputee, uh -huh. and and it just sparked my interests. He he got you know he got treated in Germany. Um, I took a train up to Germany, hung out at Ottobach, did my training in at Ottobach and South Africa, and then. I, I never changed. I, I This is all that I've done all my life, except for being a biomechanical engineer. Which kind of helps. <laughs> it helps a lot. Just a little bit <laughs> with what you're doing. Well, wonderful. So when you, so we both have in, unique business models for our patients and, and it's focused on the quality of the care with the patient. Sure. Uh, you say you spend two hours with your patients. I do something very similar. How do you approach your first visit with a new patient? You know, um, I normally do a muscle strength test. I, I do a complete physical evaluation. I do a muscle strength test, Thomas test. I check for nerves. Um, I check the patient's motivation. Mm -hmm. I make sure that the patient can, can reach three goals. They have to be able to do 200 steps with crutches mm -hmm. um, or a walker. They have to be able to do 50 sit-ups. Uh, and they have to be able to balance on on the prosthesis and the sound leg or just the sound leg if they haven't had a prosthesis yet. Mm -hmm. If they haven't reached those goals, then then I, I'm wasting my time, especially in my specialty. I specialize in anything above the knee. So any level above the knee um, is, is my specialty. I have must probably have the highest number of of hip disarticulation and, and hemipelvectomy patients of any single clinician in the world. But patients have to be extremely fit and motivated to make those those prosthesis work. Yep. So, uh, and, and if they don't meet those criteria, then they, they have to go and find the criteria. If it's an online patient, then we normally make sure that we either have video or we, we find a way to figure out that, yes, they can achieve those goals mm -hmm. before they come. I, uh, patients cannot wheel into my clinic. They have to walk into my clinic with crutches or with a walker. If they wheel in, 
I, I can't treat them. They need to have skin. Right, right. There has to be motivation. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Now, among your different specialties, obviously the above the knee, you talked about the hip disarticulation and the hemipelvectomies. We actually started having a conversation a couple of weeks ago about the subischial socket. And I know right. that is something that several of my viewers have asked me about. It's kind of coming out a little bit more, um, but we're starting to see it more in the community. What are your thoughts on the subischial socket? So, for example, who do you think is a good candidate for a subischial socket? You know, um, I really haven't found a patient, an above knee patient, that that didn't qualify for a subischial socket. I mean, I have a 74 year old gal that that is functional, uh -huh. and she wasn't functional before. So. So if, if the protocol is correct, so, so the whole idea of a subitial socket is that you stabilize the soft tissue against the femur. Yes. With regular sockets, you have ischial containment and there's a skeletal lock between the ischial tuberosity and the trochanter, and then you stabilize the femur by having a lateral curve in the wall. Yep. And, and, but in subitial, you don't have a skeletal lock. So you have to really pressurize the soft tissue against the femur. And then you create negative pressure inside the socket with the, with a vacuum pump. So all of that you pull to the sides of this of the socket wall. And I have I really haven't found anybody that hasn't qualified for one. If it's done correctly, and I tell you, the changes in patients' functional value and their comfort. Uh -huh. I had a patient that couldn't sit in the plane for four hours coming to me with her regular socket. And she could sit all the way back and she couldn't believe how comfortable it was sitting. She can ride a stationary bicycle. She can sit on a horse, on a saddle. And, and because the, the, there's no encroachment upon the groin. Mm -hmm. it's, and patients can go to the loo. Yeah. They don't have to worry about, you know, having issues with the socket getting in the way of going to the toilet. So it, it really is, it's a game changer for patients, really it is. Now, because I've heard several times on the show that you could have a door hinge and a satch foot, but if your socket is well made, you can walk like a supermodel. Patients can walk on a wheelbarrow. I they, they walk on, I've seen patients walk on things they have no business walking on, but because their socket was comfortable for them, totally. um, they, they, they walked well. And to me, a socket is, there's a lot of science, but there's also, it's an art form and the experience of the prosthetist in it. When it comes to these subitial sockets, what should people ask their prosthetist to see if their prosthetist truly has been trained properly in making a subitial socket? How many patients have you treated and can I speak to them? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's bottom that's line. Simple. That's simple. That's simple. Okay, okay. Because no, anybody, okay. I mean, anybody can tell you they've done it, but... <laughs> Can I speak to a patient that's wearing one and how is it working for them? Okay. It, there's a handful of us that actually have functional outcomes in the country. They, there's not a high percentage of prosthetists that have gotten onto this and have grabbed onto the protocol. So you, you have to get somebody that's done at least 10. Okay. Because it took, it took me at least 10 failures before I got it right. There you go. Seriously, I mean, I, I failed. I think we had 11 failures before the penny dropped and I figured out what I was doing wrong. Okay, so folks, there you have it. And this is something I, you know, I, I don't know how much, when I, when I talk to friends of mine who are not in healthcare, they're not, sometimes they have the impression that we go into our fields knowing everything that we need to know. And that's not the case. If you're a clinician, you are learning the whole, your whole entire career and you're learning new totally. techniques. Totally. And I know like from- Lisa. Yes, Lisa, negative pressure is the best way to go. Yes. I, yep. yes. And then, uh, Glenn, I went ahead and put the group name up there. It's Amputee Help and Support Line. Um, sorry, here we go. Sorry, I was trying to get through these last questions. Um, so, you know, I remember just even working with my first bilateral amputee. It certainly took me a couple of patients of working with bilateral amputees before I finally got, okay, this is what needs to happen. This is so I like the fact that you say, go ahead, ask your prosthetist, how many have they done? That's um, key. Yeah. I know that when I interview my patients, the first thing, especially if it's a prosthetist I don't know, the first thing I ask them is, So how do you like your socket? 
<laughs> do you like how it fits? <laughs> That's how I suss out if, if, if the prostitute is someone uh, worth their salt. And I'm sure the prostitutes are asking them questions about me too. Um, Vicky says, I love my suction and... So Doug is going to rehab. So Doug, you just had an amputation then? Yes, he had his second one. Okay, what level? Let's see, he says, can't wait. Any questions you can suggest, I won't even mind you sharing. Um, well, actually, this, this was one of the questions I was going to throw at you, John. Besides asking a prosthetist, you know, how many subissues they've done in general, and this is a question I get asked a lot, what should folks ask their prosthetist when they're interviewing a new prosthetist? So, I mean, the thing that you have to watch out for is the motivation of the prosthetist has to be the humanitarian aspect of what we do. We, we, I mean, think about our position. We pick a patient up from the lowest point in life and we put them back on their feet and we, we make them whole again. And, and your function in life is to, is to make patients whole. It can't just be about revenue. So, so and, and that's really the issue that I run into in the majority of patients that come to me. There, there, there is such a um, motivation to get the billing into the system so that they can get paid that they don't follow protocols to make sure that the treatment works. So, so here's how I do it. I do, I treat patients with diagnostic test sockets. They walk on a test socket. If they're local patients, they walk on a test socket for at least a week. If they're out of state patients, they walk on the test socket for at least three to four days. I can manipulate the diagnostic test socket. It's made out of a co-polyester material. I can heat it up to a hundred, to, to 500, 600 degrees, I can change it and take away the areas that hurt patients. Mm -hmm. Once the diagnostic test socket is completely comfortable, then I can copy that and make a final and I know I, I have no more issues. Right. I right. see so many patients, no, either they don't even get a test socket or they get a test socket to wear for 15 or 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes in the office. And then the prosthetist takes it back, makes the final. And the next time they see the prosthetist, they're on their final. Now, now it, it, it can't work. It, it's not possible. Number one, your, your residual limb will change within the first 24 to 48 hours of getting into a new socket because your suspension system changes, your socket design changes. You didn't come for a new socket because everything was honky-dory. You came for a new socket because the previous one didn't fit anymore. You were on 20 ply of sock or it hurt like hell. Yeah. <laughs> now here's the thing, okay? If you, if you come into a cl clinician's office with a limb that's hurting, that socket that you're wearing has created inflammation. The inflammation creates swelling. As soon as you get into a socket that doesn't cause any of that, all of that inflammation is going to reduce and your limb volume is going to reduce. So here's the trick. If you don't wear that socket for at least 24 to 48 hours, nobody's gonna know how much your limb is going to reduce or change in volume or change in geometry or even to a point where it may change to a different liner size because you're losing so much volume. Yep. So first question is, are you gonna put me on a diagnostic test socket and am I going to wear it? If they say no, and here's the story, okay? Here's the big story. We can't let you wear this because it's gonna break and we can't take liability for this thing breaking. Well, if it's breaking, then you're not doing it right. Yeah, because exactly. I have patients that go to France for three months on my test and then they're fine. <laughs> no, it, it comes reinforced. I always know when a test socket is well made because it's just weird. And they're like, oh, they knew that person was coming to see me, didn't they? <laughs> they knew I was put them. And I'm willing to bet, John, and because this is what frustrates me is when I see someone come into my clinic already with a final socket, they had 20, 30 minutes of up and down the parallel bars. Sure and I'm the first real activity that they're doing. 
Exactly. As we're doing all of my PT balance, everything, I'm starting to see, yep, this spot's lighting up, that spot's lighting up, that's lighting up, that's yeah. lighting up. And I know that with you, you, I, I'm willing to bet that those three to four days your patients are in their test socket, you are putting them through the gauntlet. They, they are doing boot camp, okay? Yeah, they're they, doing every they're, they, they're on a treadmill, they're on a BOSU ball. My favorite tool in the whole wide world is a BOSU ball. If you can stand and balance on a BOSU ball for 20 minutes without holding on, you've, got core, you've got core of steel, okay? Yeah, and I, you don't want you to gain anymore. I, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh, I, guess I can get them to do that, but I can't do that. No kidding. No, but it, it's it's absolutely true. And and, and it, it's gotten to the point where I even have one exercise that I have my patients do. And if they can do 10 repetitions of this particular exercise without pain, then I know we're good to go. But if we start seeing issues with that one exercise, I automatically close the session and say, okay, we're not going to bill you for the session. You need to go back to your process and get this straightened out first because we're not going to get anywhere. I can't teach them how to drive the car until the car is built properly. Okay. Yep. So yeah, I agree. Agree hundred percent with you. So yeah. Ashley says, Ashley's got her random question of the week. I love it, Ashley. I've had the Revo adjustable socket for three weeks now. I know there is a learning curve, but how long is that curve usually? I'm still adjusting and trying to get that adjustments correct each day. Um, Ashley, I know you've had, you're a very, very active young woman and you've been shrinking, 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 shrinking. Um, so this is something definitely to talk to your prosthetist and your physical therapist about. I'm not as familiar with the Revo socket. I don't know, John, if you have any familiarity with the Revo oh, So, So the Revo socket has adjustability and the max that it can adjust is about five to six ply of sock, okay? If you shrink past that, then it, it, it can't adjust anymore. Okay. It, here's the thing with the Revo. So uh, what's your suspension? Is it suction or is it pin? Uh, she is a below the knee, so I'm going to go with pin. I'm going to guess. Ashley, can you type that in there, babe? So, so anyway, so, 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 so here's the thing. So when you don the prosthesis, you, you, the Revo is wide open. Okay. You don't adjust it sitting down because if you adjust it sitting down, then you're pushing yourself back out of the socket. So the first thing that you do is you, you, it's wide open. You stand on the socket. If you suction, you make sure that you express all of the air. You suction. Okay. So you make sure that, so do you have a suction valve where you can actually hear the air expel? If you can't, great. You will stand on it and you will pump, pump, pump until all the air is out. Yep. Once the air is out, then you crank the knob until you feel resistance where, you, where it's tough to crank to the next click. Then you're holding. And then you go and you walk about 15 to 20 steps, you're going to pump some of the volume out and then you crank it again. But you crank it until it's tight. You don't over tighten it because here's the thing about over tightening it. You will push yourself out of the position in the socket and then you'll get to a point where you just keep on pushing yourself out and you actually feel loose all the time because you're not in the socket. So get yourself, it's wide open, get yourself in, get express all of the air. You don't hear any more expression. Then you tighten it until it's really tough to get to the next click. Then you go and take 20 steps and then you tighten it again. Then you're good to go until you start losing volume. Okay, here you go. And then oh. the questions are really good. Uh, John Mankowski says, can you recommend a soft socket for and above the knee? Soft socket. Flexible? So soft, soft socket. I'm not sure what he means by that. Do you mean the shape of the socket, John? Can you clarify that question just a little bit, please? Or are you talking about the suspension system? Uh, let's see, Harsh asks, can we use negative suction for right leg below the knee amputation? Yes, you can. You can go elevated suction. Mm -hmm. uh, the best socket system for elevated suction on transtibials is the EMS system. The EMS system was developed by a transtibial MPT called Carl Kaspers. And he's developed a system that is bulletproof. Okay, if your prosthetist knows how to make an EMS socket, that'll be the best transtibial uh, comfort value that you can get, but it'll feel like it's part of you because this the elevated suction really works on the EMS system. If you have a ring suspension system, 
elevated suction doesn't really work that well because think about it you you have a ring that seals so the elevation is going to be from the bottom ring to the bottom of the socket which in some cases is maybe 20 millimeter what are you mm -hmm. elevating that's like farting against thunder right i mean it, 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 you know you really need to elevate the whole residual limb and the only way that you can do that is with the EMS system. Excuse me, folks. And Harsh says, I'm in state patient, John. Harsh, who's next door to you? Just saying, just saying. Uh, <laughs> Daniel says, John has, has solved many with a few issues and many questions in the past four years. And even though I am not his patient, he is an amazing, caring person. Humbling. Thank you, Daniel. There we go. Uh, let's see. John uh, Harsh says, John, I had lock and pin for a long time. Tried the vacuum socket. They made me pin again, but not happy. Should I do anything different? Harsh, you're a super active young man. You should see this guy dancing, John. Really? He, he can dance. He can really dance. And he run. I, I, we, I worked sure. with him running uh, at one of our clinics in, in Virginia. So, you, so you're on a pin suspension, and you tried to change the suction, and it didn't work. Do you want to? And you want to go back to pin? Is that the question? No, he's back to pin again, but he's not happy. Should and he go? Okay. Should we do anything different? Okay, it, it's, a suction is 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 really the most comfortable socket if it's well made. It's only in the hands of the prosthetist. Okay, it's not. So, so here's the thing. Okay, the words you will get used to it. it, it Totally get rid of that in your vocabulary and, and close your ears because if anybody tells you that you'll get used to it, tell them to put a thumbtack under the heel and step on it with every step that they take. And after a week, ask them, did you get used to that? Because you know what? You cannot get used to pain and discomfort. Nope. So if, if, it's, if, if suction is made correctly, there's nothing that feels more positive and more part of you than, than the elevated suction socket. Pin suspension can't ever give you that feeling because there's always a certain amount of vertical motion. So when we designed these roll-on liners, the first one that we came up with was pin suspension. And, and, and we had so much elongation of the soft tissue that we actually started putting a matrix into the silicone to try and stabilize the silicone so that it didn't, it didn't elongate the soft tissue. So, so, so if you take your residual limb, you can move the tissue up and down over the skeletal system. With pin suspension, there's always a certain amount of movement because you're not, you're, you're not hugged in the socket. You're basically always loose in the socket. All that the pin does is it hangs the weight of the prosthesis off the bottom of the socket, but there's no yeah. other suspension medium. Mm -hmm. So, Suction is really a, a great way to go. Now, granted, some patients can't have suction. If your residual limb is shorter than 80 millimeter, there's, there's, there's very little residual limb to, to create a decent suction. So then pin suspension is about the only uh, option that you have. But you're so close to the medial tibial flare because of the shortness of the tibia that there's hardly, there's hardly any elongation of the soft tissue. The pin works really well on shorter patients, but on longer patients, boy, suction is the way to go. Marshall, like to you. He says thank you. Uh, let's see, we've got. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to catch up with some of these questions here. Ashley says thank you. That makes so much sense with regards to the Revo socket. Uh, John Mankowski says he was think. Oh, that you're thinking about an adjustable socket, John. I know that there's. There's not a whole lot of options out there. We have Martin Bionics. We have the Revo socket. We have Limb Innovations. They have a, a certain product right. still there. Is that, those are the basic, the three big ones? For those are the three product. big ones, yeah. And Limb. Out there. And yeah. I've heard many different things across the board, John. And this is something that I would love to do. I've done a show in the past on adjustable socket technology. Um, I think it's one of those cases where you really need to look at each of the different companies and look and see how, because each of those adjustable sockets is made just a little bit differently right. to see what will work for you and the prosthetist knowledge of how to put that socket together. The tough part about socketless and limb is that the prosthetist is out of the picture. So, so yeah. you take measurements, you send it to the company, they send you a socket in a box and then the prosthetist has to try and make it work. 
and and it's a it, it's kind of a crapshoot. You know, some work great, but some when they fail, they completely fail. Yeah. Whereas a Revo system, it's still in the hands of the processors if they make it in house. If they use central fab, then again, it's out of uh, it's out of their hands. So. Si Central fab is a really great way for a clinic to reduce their overheads because they don't have to have a lab, they don't have to have a technician. They simply just measure and they send it to somebody and somebody sends them a lady in a box. Right. The problem is that there's very little adjustability because there, there isn't a lab to do it. So it's really important to find a prosthetist that has a lab facility in-house because then they can fix things. Maybe they can fix <laughs> I have a question here that I wanted to answer. Um, yes. Somebody had asked, what is my favorite foot? <laughs> Barbara. Okay. Barbara, tell me, what do you want to do with this foot? Because every foot has an application. You know, if you're walking a runway, then most probably the ProFlex uh, with adjustable heel height is the way to go. If, if you want to shoot hoops, there's nothing like the All Pro. Okay, the All Pro is most probably the most dynamic foot on the planet and the least used because, because there aren't special buying programs from the company that makes it. But that foot flies, okay? They come in, the spring comes in different heights. You can even have a posterior mount, that foot flies. So, so if you want to move, that's the foot to make you move. Barbara, tell us about looking for really last week when we talked about the different types of prosthetic feet so i think you've got this in your brain right now so <laughs> some information because as many different opinions as you can get barbara the better going yeah, back okay. to Barbara's, um question about the adjustable socket i will say i've had a lot of success with patients here in my area who have those who have chosen to use adjustable socket technology because they got it from a prosthetist who was teamed up with a particular company and that made all the difference because they received direct training. And like John said, they were in-house. They have their own in-house lab where they can make all the adjustments necessary. So again, a lot of it relies upon the experience of the prosthetist, also the company. I do know, and again, guys, I'm just kind of piecemealing from what I'm hearing in the community. Um, Martin Bionics, they have actually change their model just a little bit and they have their patients come to them and build a socket for them there to provide a better quality. So I'm going to learn a little bit more about that and see if I can't get back right. to you. About that. Okay. But again, do your research. That, that's basically what it boils down to. Do your research, ask your prosthetist those questions. All right, Barbara, do you have anything in there for us? Hey, Fred, how's it going, mate? Hey. I was just talking about it before it started. Yep. I, I told, I told Kosi if she needs you. Your ears must be <laughs> that brings that that segues us right? into the next question. So, John, you have had the pleasure of working with several osseo integration patients. We're seeing more of that come into the United States. So, tell us a little bit about your work with the OI patients. So, um, uh, OI is 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 an amazing avenue if the patient can't get a functional and comfortable socket. And and the majority of those patients couldn't find a, a functional and comfortable socket. And OI really did it for them. And, you know, the, there's a lot of boohoo about about patients getting infections. But if you apply a, 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 a personal hygiene protocol, then your chances of getting an infection is, is really low. It's about as, as, as high as you getting influenza because... Th that's really what it is. If you if you don't apply personal hygiene, then yes, you'll get an infection. But if you apply personal hygiene and you keep it clean and you keep it dressed, then you're in really good shape. And that was something that I was about. Yeah, but it's yeah. It, knowing that and then also choosing the person to be the right candidate for OI. If it's somebody who is severely immunocompromised, somebody who has problems healing, they may not necessarily be a candidate for OI. So you know, in choosing right. to become the right candidate. I mean, I, I I have a patient with a compromised immune system and she has never had an infection. Wow. Okay. Because she applies personal hygiene. Stand corrected. Wow. It's all about personal hygiene, I tell you. And 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 following the rules for the initial rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. following the protocols of 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 partial weight bearing to full weight bearing over a three month period, mm -hmm. and and then and then slowly but surely getting yourself off uh, and a, an assistive walking device. Uh, I mean, the majority of amputees are osteopenic, and and it takes time to build up the calcium mm -hmm. composition. Yep. So just following the product, the correct protocol in rehab and applying a rigorous uh, dressing change protocol and, and personal hygiene protocol. And, and the big trick is finding a prosthetist that can actually align the prosthesis so that your weight line is correct and you don't uh, apply ul ulterior forces onto uh, the tibial bone or the femoral bone. Okay. There you but, go. Uh, I mean, the, the, those, those systems are bulletproof. They work really well. Um, the, but both the OPL as well as the OPRA system have been proven over and over again. There are so many patients on this system and they do not fail. No, and, and I'm excited okay. now in the US, we're starting to see more options for folks around sure. the US that are combined, sure. not just US-based surgeons, but also they have a rehab program established right. because I completely agree with you if you don't get the right right, reason. right. and 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 Fred has found a manufacturer that does quick releases so previously you had to carry around a four millimeter allen key so that you can take the system off I have put two patients on the new quick release system and it's it's unbelievable they have so much freedom because they they simply just you know loosen a lever and it's off and they put it on and tighten the liver and they're good to go. It's it's wow. incredibly how functional it is. Yep. Wow. Okay, going back to Barbara, she says, I am in an all pro. All pro is the best foot in the world, I tell you. For a functional individual that wants to shoot hoops and do aerobic exercises, uh, go for hikes, um, run a 5K, I mean, this foot can do all of it. There you go. There you go. Yep. And we've got Robin Burton. Have you ever met Robin Burton, John, from OPAF? No. You need to meet Robin at some point. Hey, Robin, she's at Nashville at the Hangar Live. OPAF and the First Clinics, I got a soft spot for them. They host the First Clinics for adaptive sports all around the country. Nice. Uh, so wonderful, wonderful. Have we met Robin? Your name is so familiar. Your names have crossed paths. She's, she's in some sure support groups you've crossed paths at some point or another i'm sure yeah yeah interesting yeah yes. wonderful um so john if people are interested in having a consult in your clinic if they are wanting to learn more about how they can be a part of your destination clinic how can they get in touch with you and your clinic how do they start uh, message me on facebook you can call the clinic um 703-723 2803. Um, I can do a phone consult. We can discuss what your issues are. Um, if it's something that I think that your prosthetist can figure out. So here's the thing about us prosthetists, okay? We have egos the size of the damn room, except when you're old like me and you're 65 and you realize because with, with age comes a, a little bit of, 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 of intelligence and we understand that we don't know it all. But prosthetists have extreme egos. So most of the time when I tell the patient to go to the prosthetist and tell him to do this and this and this, then the prosthetist has his backup and he's, well, I know what I'm doing and I don't know, this will never work. And then the patient suffers, suffers, suffers. They come over, I do exactly what I told him to do and it worked like a charm. So if it's something small, then I can just tell you to go back to your prosthetist and go and fix this. And you don't have to get on a plane or get in the car and drive to me. However, if, if we can't figure it out, then I'll do a phone consult, we'll figure it out. And if if you come over, then I, I will find a solution for you. That's what I do. There we go, folks. And that's, that's um, to, to have a clinic enough to say, I can help you, but so can the person who's already working with you. That's, that's, that's a big one right there. We just had like a whole slew of comments that just flew up on there. I know, right? I, I, can't, I can't keep up with them. Wait so I went ahead and posted the number that John mentioned. And then after this feed is over, as always, I put some information at the top of each post. So I'll be posting the information to his clinic as well as to the amputee help and support line. Right. 
Let's see, we've got. Right, and and as I say, help, MPK help and support. Um, if there's questions that come up, Michelle normally tags me in the question and then I answer it. Uh, Stacy says, John, is this above the knee or below the knee with your patients? Stacy, if, if you're referring to the patient, he sees everything. So I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, Stacy. Sure. Uh, let's see. We got Michael Burton and lots, lots of comments coming in. <laughs> All right, guys. John, you have been a very popular person tonight. Um, everybody likes the All Pro. That's pretty much a, a consensus. <laughs> it's a consensus. Yes, it's a great <laughs> awesome put. All Pro. <laughs> yep. Well, guys. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. I do want to thank you so much, John, for coming on board and spending time because I know you had a long day at work. So thank you. Thank so you much. for the invite. Appreciate it. Uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. And guys, you know, you need someone to pick a brain. This is the brain you want to be picking. Um, so check out the amputee help and support line. If you're having questions about your prosthesis and you just don't know where to go and you just need someone to ask a question, you can ask me, you can ask John. Um, and I will happily direct you back to John <laughs> to ask that question. Um, oh, Stacy, uh, the osseo integration. Osseo integration is mainly being performed above the knee here in the States. There are a few trial cases being performed below the knee as well. Right. Um, if you ask Fred, Fred knows everybody that does osseo integration. He knows all the surgeons. Um, I only know the guys on the East Coast here. So there's a there's a surgeon called Jonathan Fosberg. He's a army colonel at Walter Reed, but he got permission uh, to work at Johns Hopkins. Um, I I normally ask him for help. Uh, but Fred Hernandez, if you check in with Fred, he can tell you who's close to you, and he knows everything about everybody that does OI. Fred, right, you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> John put you there. <laughs> right. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead. <coughs> excuse me before my coughing fit starts again. We're going to sign off for this evening. As always, folks, thank you for letting me be a part of your evening. And we will see you same bat time, same bat channel next week. If for whatever reason we didn't get to your question, please, please, please private message me your question and I'll be sure to get you an answer. Good. Right. Good night. God bless.